Time for some yoga. Sit up straight and tall. The, the fluid dynamic between what's inside and what's outside of you, the idea that, or not the idea, but the practice that as you center and ground, you actually integrate better with what's around you, right? And our, unfortunately, our minds tend to draw our energy away from our feet, right? So we end up, because this, like the, I wrote this thing this weekend. Can you tell I've had too much coffee this morning? I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit hyped up, a little bit hyped up, but that's okay. Um, um, that, that the mind comes out of nothing, out of emptiness, right? But then it falls in love with the director's chair, right? And part of the process of yoga is to get the mind out of the director's chair. To actually let your, your, your quiet awareness to be present with you all the time. So there's the thinking part that tends to be less organic, but the nervous system has access to more sensation, right? Than, than what your mind has access to because your mind has to make everything an object, right? In order for it to get traction, it has to make everything an object. And most of existence is not an object. Empty space is not an object. It's a happening, right? And, and part of what's amazing about connecting with the body is that by grounding and centering, you can start becoming in alignment better with, remember, this sounds stupid, but think about the empty space as a concept for a second in front of you. It, it's totally balanced it's already integrated. And if we can participate in the profound balance of empties, I'm not talking about the oxygen, I'm talking about the space itself, right? It's already in alignment because it's everywhere. It's already going in multiple directions because it's everywhere. And what you're studying in asana is how do you integrate and become congruent? So you're not just centering, you're participating. And the thing that has to get out of the way is your mind because your mind will make it an object and separate you from it. So when we ask you to soften around the temples, the skin on the forehead, the jaw, the inside of the mouth, when we want you to feel your feet, feel your sitting bones, and then let them go. The body, asana is an example of the body being the ladder to the realization of unity, right? This isn't just a mental realization, right? So balance your head over your neck. Now, this quieter feature of your experience is congruent with action, with movement, but it takes a quieting mind to move and a lot of practice to move without judgment. So now start to feel your sitting bones press down through your feet and then connect the feet and the sitting bones by the, from the groin to the knee and the knee to the inner heel, right? It's not a coincidence that I always instruct the inside edge of your legs. Find the balance on the sitting bones that's slightly forward, not falling back. So you're using gravity to keep you connected to the earth. From that connection, hit down with your sitting bones and lift up with the lower abdomen and come on up through the chest. The center of the chest, I believe, is the most integrated part of human manifestation, right? The emptiness in the chest, 
we fill it with what we call heart, right? So hit down, rise up. So this, I've been instructing this vertical plane, but prana is happening in every direction. There's also a horizontal plane. So broaden across the collarbones, across the back ribs, as you hit down, as you rise up, these things were already happening in the empty space. You're just becoming congruent with what's happening. So more of the prana travels through your body. Now bring your hands into prayer and center your midline. Whether you can put your hands together or not, all the way, center your midline. But as you center your midline, don't lose the outer tips of your shoulders and the bottoms of your feet. Don't lose your fullness, 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 I like that. Don't lose your fullness in order to find your midline. In other words, your mind has to stop judging. You also have to believe that you can fill your vessel with your quiet space. Re-soften the inside of your mouth and your jaw. Keep rigorous in your pose. Keep the action without too much effort. See and feel what it means to fill your vessel. Surrender to it. Make sure your tongue is in the lower palate. Emptiness and fullness, effort and effortlessness, commingling in becoming. Good. And then release. Put your hands down to your thighs, palms up. So you're starting to go to what is one of the core movements, bandhas, that yogis for a long time think is really powerful in terms of congruence. So you lift your sternum and you drop your chin, but you stay grounded. And the problem with doing it in a chair is you're not as connected to earth energy, right? From your, directly in your spine, because you're not sitting on the floor. So you have to like ex allow your base to become sacred, the seat of your chair. Lift the sternum, drop the chin. In other words, activate the spine into alertness. Let it flow out through your rib cage. Notice the breath into each nostril. Let it fill each lung, sitting bones, feet, and let yourself empty on exhalation, filling on inhalation. Good, and then raise your head up with closed eyes. Open your eyes. So one of the really hard See, I teach you the hardest of my content as opposed to like when yoga teachers come to train with us. I say these things, but I don't try to teach them all the way. So one of the hardest lines about that I try to get across to teachers that are going to teach adaptive yoga is, is that the space, the sensation of space is the conduit of the subtle body. That if I'm just flexing my muscle, right, and that's it, I'm not gonna get the sense of space in my poses and it's the space that delivers the unity, not the effort. 
right? Unless my effort can become congruent with the space, right? What do I mean by space? I don't freaking know. I just know it as an experience and so do you, right? So when you lift your chest, there's the feeling of, of the, the effort to lift your chest, but there's also that you're moving the empty space in your chest, the space you don't control. You're in your body are in a constant interplay between the empty space in your pose and the space you control, which is your muscles, ligaments and tendons and less so your bones. And then drop your chest and watch how you recede out of the outer world when your chest drops. So that the lift of the chest not only spreads awareness, lift your chest again and press down through your feet. Not only does that lift spread awareness on your legs, it sends it out into the world. But you can only do that if you ground your sitting bones and your feet. So, right, and then let it drop and watch yourself recede. When we're stressed out, we tend to think we're better at occupying, you know, dealing with your life from the dropped chest position, right? It actually turns out not to be true. This simple truth is, is, is why, one of the reasons at least, why back bends help depression. Because one of the functions of depression is you're receding out of the world, out of action. And you don't realize it, but most depressed people look down more instead of up. So they let in less light rather than more light right? Because as soon as you look up, right? Don't just look up with your eyes. Look up with your eyes in coordination with your chest. Look up. That's a more integrated action, right? And then drop it. So when, you know, lots of kind of radical backbends, right? Or backbends in general are usually helpful with people with depression, but it's not, you know, and they're hard and they're activating and they're physical, why they tr are transformative is this simple change in how you interact with the space around you, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm rocking back and forth. I want you all to you know, use rhythm. So I'm coming forward and lifting my chest. And then I'm going back and falling out of participation, right? Now, by the way, the lift of the chest has no meaning without the fall for, for the mind. Like I'm not saying always strain your back to be open here. I'm saying watch the continuum of your experience. You can fall in and out of the world. Thank goodness. I want to fall out of the world when I need to sleep, <laughs> right? Those of you that had trouble sleeping, it's because you're not falling out of the world. Right, you gotta do both. So you're going back and forth and then up and over your chair again. And like knowing that it's not just that I'm opening my chest, I'm actually using the back of my chair to send this out. But my mind's not sending it out, my spine is. I'm not visualizing. If anything, my mind needs to follow and then come on back through. So this idea and then Again, we do this a lot. We're just waking up our spine, right? And then we're gonna add a little bit of complexity. Take your left hand outside your right leg, take the other arm behind you, and now twist and open your chest because now we added another variable, right? But as soon as you open your chest, my God, I hope you're feeling your sitting bones on your feet, right? Like honestly, be in the whole vessel. Good, and then come on back to center. And then take the other hand. Right, and I don't, and then it's, I'm gonna twist and lift my chest and ground my feet because I wanna stay connected to the whole vessel. Good, and then release. Over the last few weeks, or months probably, on and off, I've been talking about the circumference of the inside of your rib cage. Right, so when you take a breath, you kind of feel the expansion. It's another level of awareness if you try to think about and feel the inner circumference of your ribcage. So take a breath like you always do and feel the expansion. Remember, your mind's only going to pay attention to what it's 
used to paying attention to. So now try to be more aware of the inner circumference of your ribcage. And then don't be aware of the inner, it's hard to undo and just breathe like you normally do. Can you notice a difference? The quality of your breath should change if you're feeling the inner circumference of your rib cage. But some of you might say, oh, I don't know how to feel the inner circumference of my rib cage. Freaking make it up at first, fake it till you make it, right? Practice will reveal. That's what it does. You practice so your mind can finally join the party. If it tries to lead the party, you're not gonna get awesome. So in this inner circumference, as it's, so I try to often say that like, feel the inhalation, like a horse's nose nudging you. Let the horse's nose nudge the inside of your rib cage in all directions. But now when you exhale, I want you to lengthen. So you expand and then on the exhalation, it changes and goes this way. So you got this kind of been teaching this a lot this last few months, right? This constant interplay. I'm trying to help you feel space as the conduit of the inner body. Now there's another thing I say to teachers. I say, um, oh no, it just went out of my head. Space is the kind of the inner body. It will resist your effort, but that's not, I'm just covering. I can't remember what I was gonna say, right? So you're like making sure you're tall, right? And then change gravity again and go back and over the back of your chair, right? And I'm following my relationship. And then I'm gonna go right and take my left hand outside. My leg relift my chest. Now I'm trying to make it more fluid, right? Then I go back to center back over my chair, inhale, exhale, come forward and take the other hand outside your leg, lift the chest again, right? Back to center, feel the center, inhale, exhale, bring the hand to the outside, re-engage the expansive chest, connect it to your sitting bones, roll the shoulders back, feel down through your inner heel, grounded expansion. Dang, I need more of that in my life. I don't know about you. Good, and then come on back to center and then go the other way. Inhale, the circumference expands. Inner circumference, exhale, come over. Re-engage the lift in the chest because that's like opening yourself to the floodgates of prana, right? Coming through your body and then inhale and exhale, revolve. So you're getting this constant flow of dropping, go back to the other side, opening. And it's because you drop that the opening has meaning for your mind. And then exhale and go the other way. So we're just going back and forth, watching the fall and the rise. So the mind can figure out that they're simultaneous. They were never separate right? They were always here, right? And then go the other, keep going back and forth. I'm just going back and forth. Now, the problem with going back and forth for me is that I lose track of my legs. So I have to, the instruction then will become going back and forth, not cranking the twist, but to make sure you can case connected to your feet and sitting bones, right? At least for me as a spinal cord injured person, right? So I'm just going back and forth watching the fall, watching the rise, and knowing that I'm both, right? And then release. So, you know, oh, the other thing is that, you know, it's not just that space is the conduit of the inner body, the inner body also disguises itself as relief, okay? So the relief you feel when you finally land into bed after a long day is your inner body spreading to the outer edges, right? It's like, oh, there's my wholeness that for some reason we deny all day long as we're acting, right? So that's why I have you lift up because I'm trying to get some overt space in your low back. 
right? To help you see. I, I actually like what I'm seeing um, Lori Delahunt do. She's lifting and twisting, right? She's trying to do some of that action, right? Makes sense, what the hell? Because now she's twisting with more space and then back down. And this is also part of why in the beginning, I often have you lengthen your back, right? Because I'm trying to get, and now I like going on my elbows on the table because then I get a little bit of head, hands, headstand, right? But I'm lengthening, right, my back. But now, if I just get fixated on the length, I lose the horizontal. This is why I instruct to spread across your sacrum. And once you spread across your sacrum, I want you to feel, even if you can't do it, I want you to feel how the spread across the sacrum rolls the inner head of the femur bone in and down energetically. And as you lift your chest and you see the connective point at the inner head of the femur bone, press down through your inner heel and then lift up through your chest to add more energy to the structure. If your effort blocks the energy, you're not doing yoga. You're doing calisthenics, right? You're moving to increase the wattage through your body, not to prove anything. It's a different endeavor than physical activity. And then come on back. So, so this idea of unpacking the, which is, you know, supposedly, well, I think this is actually true in my experience too, that the seat of consciousness is to the right of the heart. So it's in the center of the chest. So the more I can do things that are grounded in the center of my chest, the more I'm working from the seat of consciousness, right? But in order to access, so everyone drop your shoulders. Doesn't that feel like you squish together the center of your chest? Like the way paper mache hits a balloon, right? Okay, that, and then if you were to work your life and all your transfers and effort from a sunken chest, the stress would go all to the muscles, right? So open the center of the chest, right? And, and notice the muscles you do to do that, right? One of the reasons why I have you back over the back of your chair is so you can feel support as this opens. So you're not thinking you create the space, you're revealing the space in the center of your chest. It's a reveal, right? And then, but in order, as I now, now, as you slump your shoulders, now sit up straight and tall on your sitting bones and realize that your base is required for this to be free. You're not free if you're not grounded. Your mind is overworking. You're not free if you're not integrating emptiness. Freedom isn't just of action. It's seeing that there are no boundaries, even though I have a boundary that is my body. So go back to the inner circumference. Extend out to the top of your head as you hit down to the sitting bones. Broaden the space between the shoulder blades. Right now, I believe you are receiving more of the prana as it flows through. Your body is actually setting itself up to feel it, but it takes effort and strain. That's why you practice and then release. So I remember, so this idea that in order to find the center of my chest, I actually have to find my base is integral to all yoga poses, right? So I remember when I started to have a breakthrough, remember breakthroughs don't have to be seen on the outside by other people. You, you have to have the strength to believe in your own breakthroughs, okay? One for me was when I recognized that when I bring my hands in front of me, however they are, right? That I can let 
my hands, my this reference be an outer manifestation of the space between the center of my chest, in the center of my chest, right? So I can actually connect inwardly. So as I start to activate, press my hands together, as I spread the palm, no matter how I'm doing it, up through the fingers or what I can control, right? I can feel the lift in my chest and the downward energy and the rise by letting the physicalness of my hands be an outer manifestation of the opening in the center of my chest. And once I start to see the opening, it refines my physical body, right? So you're using your hands as a touchstone, as a way to keep the mind occupied and then to follow. Good, and then release. One of the hardest things I found about disability for me is the loss of reference. Like I don't feel, unless I really focus, I don't feel my feet on the floor or on the foot pedals. I don't feel my sitting, my butt as much as most people do, right? So one of the other things we teach to teachers that are coming to learn how to teach adaptive yoga is the relationship between grounding and boundary and the sense of expansion. So notice when you lift your chest, we've already got that that expands. When you go back and over your chest, it really pops out into the world, right? <clears throat> but now, I want you to put your hands in the front of your knees, right? And hit back. In other words, hit the femur bone back as your chest rises, but then go inward and drive awareness from your inner groin to your inner knee to your inner heel. So there's a rise So the boundary allows you to feel the rise, but you as a yogi realize that that has to stay connected to the earth. The things that we do that are so basic in a yoga practice prepare you for your life. This energy of alertness, of the sensation of space, good, and then release. Left, left unused, muscles will contract, right? They will literally squeeze space, right? They'll squeeze it and shut down because without movement, muscles, ligaments, and tendons will tighten, right? because they need the blood flow to open. So spread your legs. <clears throat> so this idea of the center of your palm as being a touchstone, the center of your chest being a touchstone, right? Your sitting bones being a touchstone. So anything you can get, the inside of your mouth being a place of surrender, the quietness and reference on your forehead keeping your mind less active, more passive. What we're trying to do is get the core channel in relationship to a wider base, right? So I'm, I'm pushing on my knees apart and I could fall in love with the feeling of, of um, stretch on my groin. You know, there's nothing wrong with falling in love some days with, with the physical part. Right? And I, this hip is tighter than this hip, right? For this action. So I'm like compensating for that. But I want to get now the, my sense of base, my spine reaching beyond my knees into empty space. Remember, space is the conduit of the inner body. I have a harder time expanding out this knee because of the tightness of my groin, right? So I'm going to try to work this side on me a little bit more physically because that groin has to open, right? Now I can tell I'm extending out each knee, but now I want you to get to that, to extend out each knee, energetically I have to ground my feet, right? So I'm grounding my feet so the energy from my spine goes continuous into the room. And once I see that, I breathe. Take up more space. 
good. And then bring your legs back together. Taking up more space is exactly the culture and living with a disability in the culture has a, a, a consequence of where we take up less space, right? Instead of more space. And we think often that the only way to take up space is verbally, right? Being more of an activist and the core of it, it's deeper than that, right? The practice, then take the legs wide again, the practice of taking up space and living in a wider range of body experiences. Right, so now I'm gonna like come forward a little bit. I'm grabbing my, the, um, my foot rest because I don't wanna fall forward, but I'm coming forward. And so I'm taking my knees farther apart and I'm wanting more activation on my sitting bones. So I start using gravity in service of my pose. You can either you can put your hands on your seat too. I'm just going a little farther down. And with a wide leg, with a wider base, I'm lifting my chest, right? Grounding my sitting bones, extending out through my knees and connecting my heels. Even if you can't do the actions, have the awareness. And I don't mean visualize it. Again, and then release. I'm just trying to expand my base. Okay, so now, because what happens when you live, you, I remember the insight when I first was with Joe, when she had me took my legs away. By the way, I just saw my yoga teacher last week. That's where I was um, with my son, which was interesting. But um, is that when she had me take my legs wide for the first time, I realized that I had given up my birthright, which was to live in my whole body. So now I just want you to take one leg off to the side, one leg in the center. Because one of the things that happens when you live with a disability is you're not varying enough bases. If you think you'd have, if you watched a yoga class, if you think about it, one of the things that's happening. So I'm extending my knee with my forearm. I'm pressing down here. So I've got a very asymmetrical base and I'm lifting my chest, right? And instead of pushing my leg wide, I'm rolling it in and down while extending the energy, my skin from my groin to my knee with my forearm, right? And I'm lifting my chest. Again, so the energy that comes through me when the center of my chest activates actually goes through more of my body. It's not done in isolation. Good, and then release. I don't know about you, but holy crimes, am I getting thirsty, right? meaning that the energy is really moving in me. So I'm taking the other leg wide, right? And I'm trying to acknowledge the base variation, trying to figure out how to come home, even though my outer body is in a different position. So I'm lengthening this tight groin. I'm grounding here. I'm lifting my chest. This shoulder wants to come up. I'm dropping it. So all I'm doing is making sure I live in more spaces near the hub of the wheel. Good, and then release. This is a space, this space, the idea that team adaptables is, and then come forward. Team adaptables is actually having to work more, adaptive students are having to work closer to the hub of the wheel. So we don't get, like, I don't get to go upside down on my head. Um, so just lift your chest. I gotta take, I'm so hot. I'm gonna have to take off my, <laughs> my sweatshirt. Um, is, is that we have to get really dynamic near the core of a pose as opposed to near the outer edges, right? And so that's part of the challenge of adaptive yoga and why team adaptables have superpowers. Right. In an adaptive yoga class, you're not doing less, you're doing more near the hub of the wheel. Take, take the, the first side wide again. So sometime if you're at home, try putting this leg up on a chair over here, right? Over there, right? I'm not gonna do that because not all of you have access to chairs, right? But again, getting this idea of base variation, right? 
And now I'm gonna twist towards the knee that's off to the side, which is typically not like Marie Chiasen three, if you know the poses, but, but we're going, we're going, and I'm trying to find the places where I can ground, where I can twist towards the, the extended knee. But now as a, all the attention is going up here, I can tell you, I just forgot to extend out through the knee, right? So that's why you're constantly watching your poses. So you ground, extend out to the knee and twist towards the bending. I mean, the, 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 the knee out to the side right? and feel that. And then come back to center. Now I want you to really bake your noodle. This bakes my noodle. Now I'm gonna take what that just felt like and I'm gonna take the same base and I'm gonna twist the other direction, right? It's gonna have a completely different sensation, right? And the demands are different, right? So now I can tell this leg wants to follow me, my back leg, so I'm gonna push against it. My rib cage wants to fall this way because of my scoliosis. I'm gonna to have to go back against that. A yogi is both going with nature and resisting nature to create consciousness, right? So you're lifting towards, so this one's a little bit more like Janner, the beginning part of Janner Susasa, right? So you're hitting down, you're rising up and you're twisting and then go back to center and then bring the leg together. Now, I don't know about you, but that was just a big stretch on me. Whew. So I'm going to ground. I'm going to like ground and find where I am in relationship to the outer body. Knowing that if my, my poses can come from my core, I'm at the sacred heart of yoga. If my poses are trying to impress on the outside, I'm farther away from yoga than I need to be. Good. And then release, go to the first side again, take it wide. Now, if I've done my job right, you might have some sore groins tomorrow, right? Like, because we've expanded, you know, and it's okay if it's a little sore. There's nothing wrong with that, right? So I'm gonna start to go towards, okay? But as I come into this pose, before I start, instead of just turning from the outer body, I'm gonna pause here and feel the inner circumference of my rib cage. I'm gonna ground that by pressing down to this, the down leg, not the leg off to the side. And then from the inner circumference of the rib cage, in other words, my mind has to dampen itself and let the body's input in. And I'm gonna twist away from the bend. But I'm feeling not, I'm feeling the inner circumference of my rib cage hitting down through my sitting bones up to the top of my head, feeling the pressure on the back leg of my forearm. And then I'm coming back into center and feeling. Ooh. So in order to nourish, because that just opened my groin quite a bit, both of them, I'm gonna push down on my bones, right, to create ease and a sense of nourishment at the base of my spine, right? Because even though that's getting opened muscularly, I need to know where the center is. All right, and then we're going to go the other way. Again, so we're doing the same thing. We're just adding the idea of inner circumference. So I'm off to the side. I'm grounding, right? And this first time, we're going to ground towards the leg off to the side, right? We're going to twist. And so I'm pushing against this. This rib cage wants to fly out on me. So I'm hitting that back. I'm even doing it with my fist, right? So I keep an up and down energy in my spine as it twists, right? Now I'm spreading the space between my shoulder blades. And now I make sure, wait, come back, screwed up my, come back to the center. I want you to pause here and find the inner circumference of your rib cage, right? So go inward, 
pull away from the senses, practice pratyahara, find the core channel, right? And then from the inner circumference, start to turn, start to grab the, this arm over here, right? Hitting against this side, but making sure as I hit this way, right? And down, I'm expanding the inner circumference of my rib cage and connecting it down to my sitting bones. And then start to twist, lifting out of the collarbones, creating space for my life force to fill. Good, and then come on back to center. Be in the center. So one of the things that was a big breakthrough for me, and then and then come forward, right? We're gonna get movement here at the end because those are pretty strenuous, at least for me. Um, was when I realized that the student I had on the very first day I taught adaptive yoga, Chris Becker, who has pretty significant cerebral palsy, um, a lot I want to say there. So come forward, lift the chest. When I realized that his bones didn't have cerebral palsy, his brain's connection to control did because he had really bad pneumonia at six weeks, lost oxygen, right? So the idea that my core channel traveling through my bones actually doesn't have the ailment of my disability in the same way was a huge breakthrough for me. So now why don't you go back up and over your chair, come forward, come back and take the left arm up, come forward, make it all fluid, don't crank it, right? back to center, back up over your chair. So we're creating space for Shavasana. And then back and then inhale, take your arm up, bring it over, ground lift. Hopefully you feel the inner circumference of your rib cage a little bit more because you practiced it today. And then go back, come forward. Remember, it was always about the spine. And then back up and over. And then in the center, left arm up, exhale, fluid, graceful, everything we did in class, back, over the back of your chin, come in the neutral, up, down, open, trying to feel the space maybe fatigue as space and then back to center and then grounding your space that the idea of practicing symmetry before shavasana especially in a chair so if you were laying flat on a mat and doing shavasana you would get this reference over a lot of your body so i tend to try to get the reference when i'm doing shavasana in a chair i try to ground enough as relief like you would get if you were lying on the ground right so that's why i'm grounding my knees i'm letting the connection make my brain dissolve my mind dissolve letting there be some relief making sure i'm symmetrical so turns out that prana tends to reward symmetrical structure. This before Shavasana, reminding my mind that it can receive, that it's safe. Good, and then release and then Find to prepare for Shavasana. So for me, that means leaning against the back of my chair more. Finding a connection between my thumb tips. Good. 
the lightness of the touch. It doesn't have to be your thumbtips. It can be anything, any reference. Do whatever reference you have, do it lightly, right? And then let that lightness soften the inside of your mind. I need to balance my head over my neck. You know, when I'm sitting up. Shavasana is a practice of how empty space that is supported becomes nourished. So the chair, let the chair hold you up. Let your alignment help you receive your symmetry, let go, soft around the temples, the jaw, the inside of the mouth, relax your belly to relax the throat. Cascading relief, even if you're in pain. Feel your breath, don't change it. Thank your body. The inner dimension is boundaryless or spacious, even though you're bowed, your body's a boundary. So as you gently open your eyes, Feel lighter and connected by feeling your sitting bones and your feet and letting the air touch your skin. This is a good place for gratitude. 